Good morning to all of you. God has given us time. This will be the third and final lesson for prayers at nine. We found three prayers in the Bible that are found in chapter nine of their respective books. We have gone through Ezra. We've looked at Nehemiah. And the third one is... <laughs> Psalm 9 does have a prayer in it, that is for sure. Uh, Charlie had said it's either Psalm 9 or Daniel 9 uh, last Sunday, and he's right. It's Daniel 9. Daniel chapter 9 is the third prayer at 9 that we'll look at this morning. And I have ordered the three prayers in the order that you would find them as you turn through your Bible. So if, if you're going left to right through your Bible, just turning your pages, it's Ezra, Nehemiah, and eventually you will get to Daniel. Uh, there's 10 books between Nehemiah and Daniel. But chronologically, it would be Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. As I understand it on the historical timeline, it would be Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. But Daniel and Ezra are actually very, very close to each other because Daniel knows that the end of the 70 years has come and that the, the children of Israel who were exiled into Babylon are, are supposed to be carried back out back to Jerusalem to be restored to the land that God promised to their father, Abraham. And so Ezra is part of that second group that comes out of that exile. So Daniel and Ezra are really close to each other, and certainly Nehemiah would be as well. Daniel 9. There's some things here I'd, I'd like for us to see. We're going to see some consistencies with what we've read before in the two previous prayers. And I think there's something to be found there and, and realized and applied for ourselves. We're going to notice some things that these men say are really perfectly in line with one another. And that God's recorded all three of these prayers and kept them in His Word so that we would see them and read them. And, and we go through each one, and if you did it independently, you'd probably mentally kind of be removed from the last prayer that you had read and maybe not pick up on some of these things. But because we're looking at them back to back to back, we will see the consistencies, at least it'll be more obvious and more clear to us in the things that they pray for. And I want to encourage every one of us that when we pray, these things are right. God, God's approved of these things. He's recorded them for us to acknowledge what these men have said, what their request is, and, and where they stand before God, how they feel. These are giant characters of spiritual strength in the Bible. They're giants. I mean, we look to these men and we think, how could I ever have the strength of the faith that they had? And yet, James tells us when he speaks of the prophet, he says he has a nature like our own. And yet he prayed, and God kept it from raining for three years. And then he prayed again, and then God brought rain. A man with a nature like ours. So there's, there's a picture here for us that, yes, they are powerful giants in the Scripture. They are spiritual giants. They love the Lord, and they will not be moved. And that is fantastic. We need to acknowledge that. But we also want to see what they say about themselves in their own prayers. And it's okay to talk to the Lord about the condition of our life and where we are and the things that we need and the things that we see in what He said to us. So in Daniel chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 1. Daniel 9 in verse 1 says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord, through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I, Daniel, understood by the books. Daniel is an amazing and special character in the Bible. He is beloved of God. It is said over and over in this book by Gabriel, the angel of the Lord. He calls Daniel the beloved of God, greatly beloved. And Daniel has an angel who flies to him. And the angel, when he comes to him, he says, I flew to you swiftly. When you began to make petitions to God, I was commanded to come to you and I, I flew to you swiftly. That's amazing as well. That when you start praying that heaven can start moving. We see that in, this, in Daniel chapter 9. This is what happens. This is the way that God works. But you would think that a prophet of God who has the word of God, who has been right every time he has spoken, who has interpreted the dreams of great kings, even at, at the edge of a sword and be, having his life threatened, 
he interpreted dreams that the king had not even told him what it was about or what he dreamed. And he told him what the dream was, and then he told him what it meant. So a guy with this kind of insight and wisdom and power, and obviously the special help and assistance from God, why would he be looking at books? Why would he be reading books? He has a direct connection to God in heaven. If God wants him to know something, he'll send an angel. He's done it before. I want us to see here that a man of God who loves and trusts the Lord also loves and trusts his word. Yes, he has Gabriel. Yes, he has an angel coming to him and interpreting things for him and helping him along. We will watch the angel of the Lord come to Daniel at a very, very late time in his life. Very, very old man. And the angel appears to Daniel. He falls flat on his face. A man who finds it hard to get up and to fall down fell on his face before the angel of God. And the angel of God reaches down and touches him and stands him upright. Can you imagine an angel of God grabbing onto you? I mean, you know, the angel, how does he do it? Gently and lovingly. Grab on to this man, this gentleman, this saint of God, and stands him back on his feet and says, Stand up, I'm going to give you some things you need to hear and some things you need to know. That this man of God, because he loves the Lord and he trusts in his word, he's studying books. You want to be closer to God? Get your face in this book. Wear yourself out in the word of God. That's a challenge. That's hard to do. That is hard to do. To, to set time aside personally and for me to say, I am going to study this book. God has not just written down some stuff. He's given information that He wants me to know, to understand. He expects me to investigate it. And He also knows the great things that I will find there if I apply my heart. And here we have a prophet who has a communication, a direct line of communication with Almighty God in a foreign land. And he says, here's how I knew. Not because I'm friends with Gabriel, because I understood by the books. And then he names specifically the prophet Jeremiah. Go back to Jeremiah with me. Let's look at Jeremiah 25. Because he's not the only one to have studied the prophet Jeremiah. But it really is amazing to me that another prophet of God, one who has his own book, is going back to another book and studying it and saying, this is how I knew. This is how I knew that the timeline had reached its peak in Pinnacle and that God was about to move. It's from what I read in the text that was written by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25 and verse 11. Let's just read it with Daniel. I mean, this is what he read. This is what Daniel opened and read. Let's read it with Daniel. Jeremiah 25 and verse 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I will bring on that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all of the nations. Daniel's reading this and he believes in the word of God and he has the ability to know what passages to take literally. Sometimes there's some fogginess to this, you know. Was it 70 figs? Was it 70 rivers? What does that mean? Sometimes we, we wrestle with some of that. We're not quite sure how to figure all that out, the timeline, the number. This says 70 years, and he's not confused about that at all. It also says that when the king of Babylon, when God deals with the king of Babylon, that he will begin to move. Well, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1 says, in the first year of Darius, he is the king of the Medes and the Persians who have just defeated the Babylonians. He knows by the words of Jeremiah that the Babylon's been handled. Now a new king has stepped in and be, been appointed to be the new king over all of this region. And Daniel says, this is it. Because that's what Jeremiah told us. Look at Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 and verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, 
and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all of the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Daniel believes what is being said here. God says, my thoughts towards you are thoughts of peace and not of evil. You know, they've been in captivity for 70 years. And he says, I want you to know who I am, an almighty, eternal God, that my thoughts are continually thoughts of peace, joy, and for you to benefit once this is over. And like every loving father who disciplines a child who will not do what they are told, there's going to be discipline laid down, and that is also because I love you. But when we come out of this time of discipline, you're going to know that my thoughts towards you are thoughts of joy and of peace, of endurance, of understanding and wisdom. That when you come back, you'll prosper because we corrected the things that were wrong and I've always wanted you back to be with me. That is what a loving father says to his children. That is what God says to the children of Israel in this place. My thoughts towards you are thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Imagine Daniel reading that. Still in captivity in, in the final years of his life. This is what I intend for you. And for him to take hold of that and to believe that with all of his heart that he understood by the books. And what did he do next? After understanding what he had read from the books, what did he do next? Verse 3, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications. Why would he do that? Well, it's his custom, isn't it? Every morning, every evening, Daniel went into his room, he opened his window, and he faced the city of Jerusalem where the temple of Almighty God was. That was his custom. And he prayed all the time. And so part of this is because it is his custom. But can I suggest to you that what we've read from Jeremiah is that he was told twice now that those who seek me, those who pray to me, those who request forgiveness, I will be there for them, I will restore them. Understanding the books and what they say to us is vitally important, all that we can. But there's, there's a huge message in all the books that we read, and that is God saying, set your face toward me, pray to me, I will hear you. I'm waiting to hear from you. These lessons are on and about prayer, and we watch a mighty prophet of God set his face towards the Lord to make request by prayer and supplication, with fasting, with sackcloth, and with ashes. Now look at verse 4. We're going to watch him begin to pray. And again, we want to take note of the words of what the prophet says to his God. And I prayed to the Lord God. Please take note of the word Lord there. If you look in your text, it should be capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I prayed to the Lord. This is Jehovah Yahweh God. This is the first time this name for God has been used in this book. Ever since this book began to be written by Daniel the prophet, it has been Adonai, Jehovah, capital L, lowercase o, lowercase r, lowercase d. Seven times in Daniel chapter 9, we will see all capitals, Yahweh, Jehovah, God, and you know why that is, because we talk about it frequently. Yahweh is the God of the covenant. He is now bringing his prayer to Yahweh, Jehovah, covenant God, and saying the things that God has said in His covenant to His people. Daniel's prayer is so magnificent. He knows who he's talking to and he knows what he is saying. We'll watch here as we go through it. I don't, I don't want us to be confused. There will be Adonai as we move through the prayer. It's not always capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. But watch in the text and the context in which it is given that Daniel knows his God. And he is crying out to the covenant God. Jehovah. And I prayed to the Lord, my God. We see characters sometimes in the Bible say, will you pray to your God, even though they're also Jews? And we're always like, that is so weird. King Saul did that to Samuel. Will you pray to your God? You know, you think Samuel's like, what are you talking about? My God. What does that mean? And I, that always troubles me. I, I can't say that I know exactly what's being said or what's happening in every moment, but it does trouble me. He's our God. Jesus says when he prays, our Father who art in heaven. Well, he is the only begotten Son of God. And yet he invites us all in when he says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. Jesus brings us in. 
into an inheritance and a relationship that's guaranteed to us. It is a beautiful picture of who God is. Daniel understands that too. I prayed to the Lord my God. I made confession and I said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and with those who keep His commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from Your precepts and Your judgments. Neither have we heeded Your servants, the prophets. This man has read the prophets his whole life. And he says, we have not done. He includes himself. We have not heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and to our princes, to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. In Daniel chapter 1, we are told that he is the children, one of the children of the kings of, of Judah. He is one of the nobles. He is very, very young when he's brought into exile, but he is a child of the king's family. And he said, he, all of this is very personal to him. Our kings, our leaders, our fathers. They did not heed the words of the prophets. Our fathers failed in not listening to Jeremiah when he warned them over and over and over again. And, and, and you did what Jeremiah said you would do. And now this man who knows that his father's house was destroyed and burned with fire is going to the same God and saying, my father didn't pay attention to your prophets. And forgive us for that mistake that we made. We did not heed. He includes himself as a young man. We were not listening to Jeremiah. That, that is so powerful to me and that is so amazing that he is willing to say, those things. To us belongs shame of face. I hope you've seen with me the common theme that we have taken note of in each and every prayer and the prayers at nine, and that is a man who will pray to God and never says, your people are messed up, Lord. They are in a terrible mess. And, and you warned them, and you told them, and I'm reading it, and they, they are in big trouble. Just me and you, Lord. Not one of the three men approach God that way. Every one of them says, we have sinned. There's a recognition here by each man, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel, as they confess their own sin, their own rebellion, their own iniquity, and their own wickedness. They admit to God that they did not heed the prophets that God had sent. And in that consistency, we can see a humility that we must consider and appreciate. That they know that they're not God. They know that they are men and they make mistakes and everybody in this room fits in that category. Romans chapter 3 deals with that crystal clear. There is no, not one, who is righteous before God. No, not one. Paul repeats it over and over and over again. Not one. If there's anyone left in the room who thinks, I think maybe I'm still in the group where I'm, I'm worthy, Paul says, no, once more. I'll tell you again, no, not one. And these men understand that. As faithful as they are and as strong as they are in the faith, they understand that. All three men confess their own sins. Ezra chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 33. Daniel chapter 9, verses 5 through 11 and 12. Through 16, Daniel is just going to keep saying it over and over and over again. He has been saved from a den of lions by God. And he goes to God and says, I have sinned against you. In all the victories that God allows us to have and that God will bless us in, we still need to be honest about who we are, the challenges we face, and where, and where we are as we stand before God and approach Him in prayer. Daniel chapter 9, pick up now with me from verse 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against Him. This is exactly what Moses said to God in Numbers chapter 14, which was read for us just a few minutes ago. God is abundant in mercy. He's long-suffering. Daniel says the same thing. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against Him. There it is again. Though we have rebelled against Him. 
We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yet all Israel, yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster for under the whole heaven, such as has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn to, to, from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. The last prayer we read last week, it's the, in Nehemiah, it says that they, they cast your word behind their back. We talked about that a little bit. The sin and the iniquity of our fathers was that they cast your word behind their back. The precepts and the laws that would have kept them pure and holy before all nations and most importantly before God, they said, we don't want to follow that anymore. So God says, well, you're still in a covenant. You have free will. God calls upon one of his prophets to bury a harlot. To embrace her as his wife and to know that she will forsake him and abuse their relationship. And when the first son is born out of that relationship with that prophet, God gives him a name for that son. And the name is Not My People. Prophet lived out what God felt when his people turned their back on him. Prophet now has a son that his name is, I'm not even sure if you're mine. God is heartbroken over this, and he's right and he's just in everything that he's done. And Daniel, in a deep heart of repentance, in a, in a, in a seeking heart for forgiveness, has gone to God and said the things that need to be said, and they are recorded for us today. He says, you're not wrong, Lord. You've caused us to suffer great sufferings because it is written in the law. He knows it, and he's coming to terms with it. Verse 15, and now there's a turn here in the prayer. And again, this is good for us as we pray to God after those confessions are made. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt, with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our, our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. What a great understanding from this man. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. We are watching here over and over again that his concern is not personal in its nature. He's concerned about God. He's concerned about his name and he's concerned about God's people. Let your face shine upon your temple and your city and your sanctuary because you are to be glorified, God. Bring us back and restore us because you have promised that you would. It is all about glorifying God and basing it upon what He has said and what He has promised. Another important theme that we've seen in all three prayers at nine is that each man has praised God for all that He is. Each one of them declares Him to be righteous, to be faithful, to be the Creator of all things. They declare Him to be merciful, and they declare Him to be just. This is not in our reading for what I have for us here, but just look with me, if you will, for a moment at verse 20. 
Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Look at verse 23. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Man is in exile, and he's praying to God based on the words of Jeremiah the prophet. I know your word. I understand what it says. I'm begging you, Lord, have mercy on your people. Let your name be glorified in the place that you determined to call your own. And this angel says, I flew swiftly as soon as you began praying. Imagine for us, you know, we pray to God and we think about, Lord, do you even hear me? I've been asking for this. I need this to happen. Please be with me. Do you hear what I'm saying, Lord? Please understand. My request is sincere. It is real. I've done all that I can. I'll live out my life to show that I need this to be done as I am asking you to help me with this very thing. We go to God and we pray for him. And here we have a moment in time when the angel of the Lord flies into his room and says, Daniel, greatly beloved, when you began, when you said, dear heavenly father, God said, go. And I got here as fast as I could. What an amazing, amazing moment in time. We know it's true because it's given to us in the Word of God. You are greatly beloved. Look at chapter 10 and verse 10. Suddenly a hand touched me and made me tremble on my knees and on my palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you. I want us to see that it says greatly beloved over and over again because he is. This angel is not lying to him. He is greatly beloved of the Lord. I want to take what we read here and I want to apply it to each one of us today because you need to know. You need to understand if you're faithful to God and you keep His Word, you understand His truth and you pray based and according to His will that He hears us. We know that He hears us if and when we pray according to His will. Knowing and understanding God's Word should move all of us to constant prayer. There are many places in the New Testament that I could turn to show you that, but I'd like to take you to the Gospel of Luke. Look at Luke with me. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 9. Luke 11 and verse 9. Jesus, the Son of God, says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Did you read it with me? We read from the books? Did we read it? Do you understand? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Jesus is not wondering about this. He's not thinking out loud and just hoping this comes true. If you do this, these things will happen. We've read it in the book together. Directly from the lips and from the mouth of the Son of God. Verse 10, For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from, my, from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You see, reading and understanding the books will drive a faithful member of the Lord's church to constant prayer. Jesus just told us it's true. We love Him. He's our Savior. He's our King. He does not lie. He is truth. He is the Word of God. And He says, this is how this works. Go to Him. Ask, seek, and knock. It will be given. And because these people are just staring at Him with their mouths hanging open, He says, okay, here's an earthly example. Which one of you fathers here, when your child says, Dad, I'm hungry, and let's get more serious. Let's say, which one of you having a father who looks, a child who looks to their father and says, I'm starving. And the father looks down and he can see the bare bones, the rib cage of his child, starving to death. Which one of you, and you're evil, by the way, you're evil. Which one of you would say, here's something you can chew on and hand him a rock. How disgusting, how, how awful that would be. We're evil and we know that's wrong. 
So Jesus takes that and he says, okay, if you understand that, go to your heavenly father. And if you're hurting, then tell him. God, I'm hurting. He knows that. He can look to you and see that. But he will give and he will grant and he will assist. I think one of the biggest challenges we have in these statements is we say, well, I'm going to ask for that shiny new red bicycle. And he better give it to me. That's not what we see here in what Jesus is giving to us. It is that God will provide. And so for us, it, it's not, okay, Lord, here's what I want, and here's the way I want you to do it. Okay, get to it. That's not the prayer, that's not the prayer or the request or the supplications of one who loves the Lord, is seeking God, and understands His will. You see, a member of the New Testament church who goes to God and says, Dear Heavenly Father, I need strength. I am struggling. That we understand by the Word of God that God doesn't go, Zap! Now you have strength. God in His Word has told us where that strength can be found. It's found in Him. Always. First and foremost, it's found in Him. But what does He provide? How many times do we ask for God for help for something in particular and never turn to the church which He's provided to grant us that strength, that comfort, and that assistance. If I understand His Word, I understand that the church has been built and established for my good, that you are all here for me to do better, to be stronger, to be comforted in my time of need, in my time of pain. That is by God's design. So for me to pray and say, please magically zap me and make me stronger or, or, or cleanse me of this issue or the problem that I face, and, and refuse or neglect to turn to the church with that same request, God is saying to us, at least in that sense, I've given you and I've told you what it's for. You understand by the books. And so I just want us to see in this example that I give that it's not always just he's going to fix it. It's He probably has fixed it. He's probably already shown you how in his word, how this works out. But because the way we pray and the way we request and the way we want it, we, we refuse to accept that which he's already given. And I think the church is a very good example of that. There's other ways in which that works out in our lives. And I do want each one of you, especially me, to be mindful of those things. Pray for something that you need, the care and the concern that you have as you've given it to God. And when you're done praying to God, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Open your heart to the Word of God and take, an, take a close look at to how He may do that for you. Because I think that, that, that opens everything up for us to have a better understanding of who God is and what He wants us to see in the work that He's already accomplished in our lives. Luke 21 and verse 34. Jesus is going to speak to us again. Luke 21 and verse 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. He wants us to pray and to be ready for that day because it will come unexpectedly upon the whole world. Jesus says, watch and pray. If I am reading the books and I am understanding the instruction that's given by God Himself about these things, I am a person who is driven to constant prayer. Daniel was told several times, you are greatly beloved by God. What a comfort that is. And I want to leave you with a comforting word from Jesus, the Son of God. I hope you're praying. I hope you continue to pray. We're going we're gonna to look at this as long as God gives us time throughout this year to do this very thing, to be thinking about prayer and the power of prayer. I, I want to I just remove any possibility that any one of you as members of the Lord's church would say in this moment, yeah, but I'm not Daniel. And I say to you that if you're a member of the Lord's church and you are in the kingdom of God, that you're greater than Daniel. Jesus says in Luke 7 and verse 28, For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Of all the prophets born among women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, David, Isaiah, there's none greater than John the Baptist, who was in prison at the time, by the way. There is none greater in the eyes of God than John the Baptist. 
But I say to you, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. You're a child of God. You have the New Testament in your hands. You are greater to the extent that Jesus has told us here than John the Baptist in your understanding, what you've come to know and what you've learned to be faithful to. We understand by the books that we should be in prayer. Daniel is such a great example. But he's not greater than us, not in God's eyes, because we are God's children through the covenant and the eternal promise that was granted to all of us, including Daniel, by and through his son, Jesus Christ. What a blessed privilege it is to know that you are greatly beloved by God. You are his children, and he hears you when you go to him in prayer. Remember all the things that we've seen in these three men, the great examples they've set, their willingness to confess their own trespasses, to ask God to see through the things that He promised. That that is a great and awesome prayer every time we say it to God in heaven. If there's anyone here this morning who needs to respond to the gospel, we do uh, want to encourage you to do that. Obviously, to be a child of God is the greatest thing you could ever do or to become in this life. The greatest. God's made that possible because He wants it to be true in your life. He's made it possible for you to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to repent of your sins, to turn away from those things be baptized in the watery grave of baptism and to know, to be assured, according to Romans chapter 6, that you would raise up a new creature inside of Almighty God, child of God. That needs to happen this morning. Let us help you do that while together we stand and sing.